Howard Silt has been the sheriff of Putnam County for over two decades. Before becoming a sheriff, he was a detective, and a very well respected one too, with a track record of solving every murder that he was assigned to, and that was until 2014, when a truly gruesome and bizarre murder occurred. Before I start, just a quick thank you to Wicked Clothes. Without them sponsoring the channel, I wouldn't be able to make the amount of content I do, so if you appreciate the channel, make sure to go check them out. They're genuinely one of my absolute favourite online clothing stores. And right now, they have a fantastic sale on, and they're always releasing new creative designs. Here, you can see me repping one of my favourite pieces, so if you want to look as cool as me, click the link in the description, and I know you'll love them just as much as I do. And if you see anything that you like, use Disturbin in the coupon section for 10% off. They also have free shipping for orders over $75. And now, onto the video. This case takes place on the 6th of May 2014. 88 year old Russell Dermond and his 87 year old wife Shirley had been married for a very impressive 64 years. The couple had four children, three sons and a daughter, and they eventually would go on to have nine grandchildren. The two married on the 15th of December 1950. In the mid 1940s, Russell served in the Navy during World War II. Shirley was an avid writer, artist, and a stay at home mother who raised their children. After serving his country, Russell entered the hospitality industry and was very successful. He owned several Hardy's franchises in Atlanta, and after working hard for a good chunk of his life, he passed his restaurant business onto his children and retired in 1994. The Dermans then moved to Eatonton, Georgia, and built this incredible home overlooking Lake Oconee. Their home was located in a gated community. They chose the particular spot as it was in a wooded area and it was very private. Perfect for a couple who enjoyed their privacy. The location also helped to give them a feeling of safety and security. The Dermans were very religious and they also loved nothing more than spending time with their children and grandchildren. Family time was important to them. On the 6th of May 2014, a woman made a call to the emergency services. This woman was one of the Dermans' neighbours, and she was in a very distressed state. She told the operator they had found a dead body. The neighbours of Russell and Shirley had not seen the couple for a few days. They became worried after they didn't show up for the plans they had made. The neighbours tried calling them, but the Dermans never picked up the phone. They peeked through some of the windows where Russell and Shirley would often sit together, but they were nowhere to be seen. They then realised their door was open. They entered and walked around their house shouting their names. There was no response. The neighbours then went around to their garage, and there was the body of Russell. Russell was found behind one of the couple's cars. He had been decapitated. It's then when the neighbours made the 911 call, and investigators were soon on the scene. Police officers searched the house, and they soon discovered that Shirley was nowhere to be found. And not only that, Russell's decapitated head was also missing. Towels had been placed around the neck area of Russell's body to soak up the blood, preventing it from flowing under the garage and onto the driveway. The decapitation had been done some time after he had been killed. There were no splatters of blood from severed arteries found around the house. Whoever had decapitated Russell appeared to be somewhat of an expert. The head was cut with extreme precision. Gunpowder residue was found on Russell's clothes, but there was no gunshot wound on his body. The police concluded that he must have been shot in the head execution style and then decapitated. By doing this, the police wouldn't be able to examine the bullet that was used. Because of the nature of the murder, police theorised that it could be something to do with criminal organisations. 
Often with this kind of killing, it's somebody wanting to send a message. This theory was dropped fairly quickly. There was no sign of forced entry and the house had not been ransacked. Nothing had been stolen. So the theory of a burglary gone wrong became less likely, but not entirely ruled out. The whole case so far was beyond perplexing. There were no unknown cars that were detected coming into or leaving the gated community. Investigators checked the surveillance cameras at the entrance of the gated community, but frustratingly, a storm had destroyed them just before the murders had taken place. The police searched the house for clues, but everything was immaculate. They tried to find fingerprints and used luminol to uncover any blood residue that could have been cleaned up, but the extensive searches turned up absolutely nothing. The police were worried that whoever was responsible for this disturbing crime could now be holding Shirley hostage, if they hadn't killed her already. The search to find Shirley began. They began searching the lake and the woodlands that surrounded the area, but there was no sign of Shirley anywhere. Billboards were set up and sniffer dogs were brought in. The media quickly spread Shirley's photograph in hopes that someone could come forward with information, but tragically, no one came forward with any leads. Ten days after Russell's body was discovered, on the 16th of May, two fishermen were out on Lake Oconee when they saw something floating in the water. Upon closer inspection, they were horrified at what they discovered. Floating in the water was the body of Shirley. Her body had swollen to twice the size due to being in the water for so long. She was found five miles away from the couple's home. Shirley had been killed by blunt force trauma to the head. The wounds to her skull were incredibly deep. A hammer was believed to have been the murder weapon. Whoever had done this had used some serious force. The attack seemed frenzied, very different to the precise and calculated decapitation performed on Russell. Two 30-pound concrete blocks had been tied to her ankles. Investigators first believed that they were dealing with professional killers, but the way that Shirley's body had been disposed of seemed to have been done by an amateur. A professional would have known the weight was not enough to keep a body submerged. Plus, an expert killer would more than likely just shoot the victims and leave as swiftly as possible. The risk of taking a victim away from their home would be too great, especially in a gated community. The question was, who would do this to an elderly couple in their late 80s? The Dermans didn't have any known enemies. As far as it seemed, they were just an elderly couple living their final years in peace. Financial records were examined and there appeared to be no dodgy dealings, and Russell had no history of bad business deals that could motivate somebody to do this. Their oldest son, Mark, was killed in the year 2000 in a drug deal gone wrong. Investigators believe that there is no connection between this crime and the murder of Shirley and Russell. Investigators turned to the surviving children of the couple, Bradley, Keith and Leslie. They quickly concluded that none of their children were anywhere near their parents' house at the time of the murders. All of the children were given a polygraph test, which they all passed. Detectives also could not find any motive or evidence that their children had hired someone to do this. Investigators believe that at least two people were involved in the murders of Russell and Shirley, and they think that the couple were familiar with the killer or killers. Due to the apparent lack of struggle and no signs of forced entry, the fact that no items were taken from the house has truly confused those who have worked on the case so far. They have also theorised that the couple were killed somewhere else. Whoever had killed the couple had more than likely used a boat to pull up to the couple's private dock. They then walked around to the house and rang the doorbell, 
They were then either willfully let inside, or they forced their way inside the house. They then took them away to be killed, perhaps in the dead of night. The time frame of Russell's murder is somewhere between 4.30pm on May the 1st to 6pm on May the 4th. The case has haunted Howard Sills for years. He says that it's the first thing he thinks about when he gets up on the morning and has had many nightmares about the case. Nothing about it makes any sense. Why kill an elderly couple up close and personally? Why was nothing stolen? Why did one murder seem somewhat professional and the other one sloppy? Howard hopes that if he is retired and the case is still unsolved, that the new sheriff will let him continue to work on the case. He is under the impression that the murder began as some sort of extortion, that somebody believed that the Dermans were in possession of something that they didn't actually have. And when they discovered they didn't have what they wanted, they violently lashed out. He's fairly certain that more than one person was involved. The bizarre double murder has remained as confusing as it was seven years ago. Someone somewhere knows something. If you wish to leave a tip, information can be found in the description. Hopefully one day, this crime can be solved. But as of now, there are no witnesses. There are no suspects. No DNA, no fingerprints, and no motive. And to this day, Russell's head has never been found.